The young don't always see evil, so why do we continue to show them? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my Foul Play February series. I'm Brooke McKenna, but this is a Jane Doe case. And Doe cases hit me much harder than most because not only were their stories abruptly ended, but their identities were wiped right out from under them. And if I can even give them a little bit of light with my video, I want to do that. And I do want to warn any of you that it is about a child today and so I know that it's harder to swallow. It is very important to spread her story but if you cannot handle it or you cannot stomach it today, maybe don't watch this video. By the way, I am posting every single day this month for Foul Play February, so if you were interested in topics like these and you want to support them or me, I would appreciate if you would thumbs up this video and subscribe if you're not already. Now let's get into the story. So it was February 28th, 1983 in St. Louis, Missouri. There was two rummagers whose car had broken down and who went into this abandoned building at 5635 Clemens Avenue looking for a pipe or some sort of equipment to help with their car and to get it running again. So they went to this abandoned building, they went to the basement, they were looking around, and one of them flicked on their cigarette lighter to be able to you know, light their cigarette and also see a little bit. And that's when they saw something that would haunt them for the rest of their lives because they had found the body of a little african-american girl who was from 8 to 11 years old and was only wearing a yellow v-neck sweater that was blood stains and had the tags ripped out of it now this girl was from 410 to 56 weighing approximately 60 pounds she was face down when they found her and her fingernails were painted on with two coats of red nail polish, but she had her hands bound behind her back with red and white nylon rope. The worst part of all, though, was that she had been decapitated, and there was now mold growing from her neck. When these two rummagers ran outside, they called the police, and when the homicide detectives got there, their names were Joe Bragoon and Herb Riley, and their immediate thought was, that this was a prostitute or a homeless woman, but in fact, when they rolled her over, they found that she hadn't even yet gone through puberty. She was far too young for any of that. After looking at her, they concluded that she had not been beheaded there. There were zero traces of blood by her body, and they believed that wherever she was decapitated, it was with a large carving knife because of how precisely it was cut and that her blood was also drained wherever she was decapitated before she was brought there. Then traces of blood were found on the sides of the walls by the staircase where it led down to the basement, but that just concluded that she had been carried down and her body had brushed against the side, leaving those traces. But perhaps the worst part was that her head was missing and they couldn't find it anywhere. And the odd thing was her nails were painted, they were freshly painted. She looked well taken care of besides all of this. Like somebody did care for her. The rest of her body was sent to the St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office where they concluded that she had been sexually assaulted. Although some articles will say that it was concluded that she had not been. But I read that the examiner's office said that she had been. They found that her cause of death had been strangulation before she had been beheaded and there was no contents in her stomach when she died. The Missouri Botanical Garden did tests on her to test the mold to see if they could determine a time of death and from that they found she had been killed within five days of her discovery. But they still hadn't found her head, meaning they couldn't look through dental examinations to identify her. They couldn't do a facial reconstruction to send out to the media for people to identify her. They had nothing. They pretty much decided to search one child at a time and began going to the local schools, asking around if there was anybody missing, asking if anybody met her description, and nothing was coming up. It didn't seem like she even existed in any of these schools. Or anywhere around there. They of course tried the database for the missing children but nothing matched her description and her age. 
just two months after she was found, a woman came forward saying that she had met this little girl's killer that she had been invited into this house and found a machete and a human skull. When the police tracked down this person went into their house, they found that the machete was fake and couldn't hurt anybody. And the skull was from a teacher from a long time ago that they had got and it didn't match the little girls. Then an officer was cleaning out a shed nearby when he came across a skull and the owner said, that it was a Native American woman who had been killed by a tomahawk and when it was tested, it was found that it was too old to be this little girl. She was now being referred to as Little Jane Doe or Hope. But on December 26th of that same year, another little girl's remains were found. They were only partial in North Carolina. She was dubbed Northampton County Jane Doe and she wasn't being identified either and some people believed that she was the missing remains of little Jane Doe because she was only a partial skeleton found in a wooded area and there was some sort of trauma done to her face but her cause of death was never established but they had also ruled her to be between the ages of four and six, which would be too young to be little Jane Doe, but with little information to go off, I guess either could be slightly incorrect, but either way, it was ruled out that those cases were connected. Little Jane Doe's fingerprints had been collected and any of her DNA stored away, but they weren't being identified in any of the databases whatsoever. There were no identifying factors on her body either, no distinct marks, no deformities. The only thing they could find was something that I'll put right here, and it's basically a deformity of the spine, a small one, and the kind she had was the mildest version of it, which meant that it didn't really even show, and most people don't even know they have it. With very little to go on and not many more options, they actually sought the help, the investigators did, of some psychics. They sent a photo of her fingerprints to them and they performed a seance. They went around, they all held the photo, and by the end of it, they all agreed that her head was on a boat on the Gulf of Mexico and that they needed to contact the Coast Guard immediately. But even though the police hoped that this would be exactly where her head would be and they could solve this whole thing, it was also a dead end. But 10 months after finding her body, there was not much else they could do. So they decided it was time to bury her on December 2nd of 1983 in a little pink checkered dress. But that wasn't just where this case ends because they wanted to solve it so badly. They were so invested and so heartbroken that they couldn't find out who this little girl was. So 10 years later, they decided to try another psychic who they mailed the yellow sweater and the nylon rope to. The psychic said that she would do it, but she needed to touch it. She needed to feel it. So they sent it to her. They waited for the answer, but the psychic said that they never received the package and those things were never seen again. Three years after that, in 1996, one of the original investigators, Herb, died, and this case was one of the two he never solved. Only two in his career. At one point, they believed that little Jane Doe had been a victim of a serial killer named Vernon Brown in the area. He had been murdering young girls from 1980 to 1986 in the Indiana, Missouri areas. He was said to have started in Indiana in 1980, where he was arrested for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl. Shortly after his release, a 9-year-old girl named Kimberly Campbell was found strangled and sexually assaulted in the basement of his house that Vernon's grandmother owned. He was an obvious suspect, but there wasn't enough evidence to charge him. And a year after that, he actually fled town to avoid arrest on another sexual assault charge. And that landed him in St. Louis, Missouri. In March of 1985, a 19-year-old named Sinetta Ford was stabbed and strangled in her apartment, one that Vernon worked at under an alias. But yet again, he had no, they had no evidence against him to charge him and had to let him go. 
the next year on October 25th of 1986, a nine-year-old named Jeanette Perkins went missing on her way home from school in St. Louis. Her path home was right by Vernon's home. And when the police went in to search, they found her strangled and sexually assaulted in his basement. Finally, they had caught him red-handed and he was going to jail. He was sentenced to death, but before he was executed, the investigators of many different cases were asking him, pleading him to just confess to these murders, especially the murder of little Jane Doe. But he refused, and on May 17th of 2005, he was executed without ever admitting to it. But then 20 years after little Jane Doe had been found, they decided in 2013 to exhume her body, hoping that, you know, the advancements in technology and forensics would help find who she was. Except for the cemetery that she was supposedly buried at was so unkempt and was just plain disgusting that they couldn't even find her remains. There had been a little tombstone for her that had been placed on the wrong grave and it took forever to find where she actually was. It took weeks to find her burial records, and after that, they used a photograph of the casket to compare it to the graves, and they eventually found her after hours of digging. After that, they sent her back to the St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office to test her bones and the minerals to basically determine the native origin where she lived based on what she drank and how it affected her body. From this, they concluded she lived most of her life in southeastern states like Georgia, Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Louisiana, and North or South Carolina. She was reburied in a better cemetery called the Garden of Innocence, and they were afraid that they would never find little Jane Doe's name. But any information at this point helped because before they had none, so now they had a select group of states and they were going to send it out to the media to refresh the minds of people in those areas that hopefully possibly a loved one would come forward and see it or a possible witness who didn't even know what they witnessed or who were now ready to come forward would see it but still nothing came of it. They still believe that this killer was local. It was a building that was kind of out of the way, but with searching all of the schools and not finding a little girl with this description, they believed that little Jane Doe, or Hope, was not from the area. And with this new test, that basically confirmed it, meaning that could have been why no one ever came forward with her case, because they weren't in the area where all of the information was being blasted. But little Jane Doe is still without a name, so if you know anything, please contact the St. Louis Police Department at 314-444-5822 or the St. Louis City Medical Examiner's Office at 314-622-4971. But what do you believe happened to this poor little girl? I can't even imagine what sort of sick person could do this to a child. Do you think that it was Vernon? I think that between 1981 and 1996, where her murder happened, where she was found, he just kind of seemed to vanish. And someone with this type of personality, someone with this sick mind, really, that continually did this to girls and got away with it, couldn't have gone that long without doing anything. And so, I really think that just because he wasn't caught in that doesn't mean he didn't do it. Although some do say that he was far too mentally challenged to do that. Some say that he had a very low IQ and that getting away with the other ones for so long was just by chance and that his stepsons had even seen him do it to these other girls and just didn't say anything. So it wasn't like he was hiding it. But I don't know. I do believe that he had the same MO and I guess it almost just feels better to think that her killer possibly was executed and didn't get away with it even if he wasn't attached to her name. I also find the whole psychics reading thing was very odd. I get that sometimes that works in cases. It's kind of just a last hope type thing, which is where they were in this case, but I find that with the last one, 
even though, you know, some psychics do want to touch it to get a better reading, I understand that, but to completely misplace it and then for everybody involved to just kind of drop it and pretend like it doesn't matter, it's just kind of strange. Some people say maybe the psychics knew something, maybe it wasn't really a psychic and they were just pretending to be to get more of her, you know, belongings, more of the evidence in her case so it was never found who actually did this. But after so long, I mean, you'd think that unless they were worried about some DNA being found on the sweater, that it wouldn't really matter if it hadn't mattered before. But I don't know, I just find that really odd that nobody seemed to care after that. But as heartbreaking as this is, we cannot stop searching. Her name for now is Hope until we can find her real one. So we really cannot stop searching. And even though it was so long ago, I felt that it was so important to share this video. You never know what can come of these cases of the right person seeing the right information and something just clicking. Let's just hope that this little girl gets her name back. She was just a little girl. Thank you so much for listening to her story and for just supporting me in the way I tell it as well. Remember, I am posting every single day this month, so you can come back tomorrow for another video. And please thumbs up just to support me and support little Jane Doe as well. And you can share this case if you would like, or just share, you know, the information that I told you about it. That would be wonderful as well. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Fear is easy to have, but hope takes a little more than that.